So it's uh, it's really cool to be here, um, and I'm going to spend um, about I think you know about half an hour or so, half an hour to 35 minutes, talking a little bit about what we're working on, uh, but also focusing on just not not just what we're doing, but also our journey. Um, there's going to be mostly a business perspective um, on on what it is that we do, um, but I'll bring in also um, you know the tech perspectives, and happy to to take any kind of more in depth technical questions towards the end, although. I'm I'm not the CTO of the company, so so there's there's a little limit to what I can be talking about. But in very short, so if I introduce myself first, my name is Anita Shelbreda. Uh, I am the CEO and co-founder of Iris AI, um, and we actually uh, this day, this very day, our company officially celebrates five years. So we're still in the startup phase, but we've, we've been around for a while. We've been doing, you know, both research and development in the AI space for five years. So we've been through kind of quite a journey um, in those five years. Um, and where we started five years ago was that we started with me and my uh, co-founders were challenged. We participated in this summer program at, at something called Singularity University and where we're challenged to come up with an idea that would positively impact the lives of a billion people uh, within a decade. Small challenge, simple enough. And, you know, as the, as the introduction say, uh, what I said, what we found to be like the place where we could really make impact, uh, where we now know more than ever that it is vital to the success of our species was it's quite simple, science. And, the problems of scientific research uh, are, are are plenty, and I'm not going to list them all. But the biggest problem and challenge that we have in scientific research today is that we are living in a world with an absolute exponential growth of knowledge. That's true across the world, not just in the scientific fields, but it's also true in science. We publish 5,500 research papers every single day. Uh, and it's growing by about 4% of that output in itself. So we have a growth of the growth and uh, it is becoming exponential and it is increasingly hard to navigate. And of course, with the introduction of the internet, all of, well, not all of, but a lot of research was put online and that was great. Um, but the problem is that navigating it, finding it is becoming increasingly impossible. There's plenty of tools out there, right? Google Scholar and Semantic Scholar and plenty of good search engines. And if you know what you're looking for, that's great. But actually finding exact bits of knowledge when you don't know what you're looking for and having the world's knowledge, scientific knowledge at your fingertips at all times, that is simply not possible. And so five years ago, we started setting out to say, okay, what, you know, what do we need to solve? What could we possibly solve? Making scientific research more accessible to more people. And when we looked at that, you know, at that time, I was not an, an AI company founder. I had learned a little bit about artificial intelligence and machine learning, but very, very little. But I understood enough to understand the potential of AI and natural language processing applied to scientific text. And so we set out to build what we called then and still call now the AI researcher. Um, and our vision was then and continue to be five years later a research assistant that will be an essential part of any research team in academia and industry across the world making sure that we have all of the knowledge of the world at our fingertips at all times so you know a little a little little undertaking a little you know side project if you like um but that's that's where we started right and that was five years ago and we were definitely norway's first ai company ai startup uh we were one of the few in europe that really got a lot of attention in 2015-16 um early 2016 we were part of you know TechCrunch disrupt and 500 startups and we got like all this visibility and then we've kind of just kept going since and, and you know, getting funding, getting research grants, getting clients, etc. So it's been quite a, an interesting journey being part of this, um, you know, for for so long, five years feels like ages in in both the AI world and the startup world. 
Um, but what I what I kind of wanted to cover today, I wanted to talk a little bit about the tools that we started building and what that we have built, which is a suite of tools for for academia. But then I wanted to talk about some of the challenges we faced, some of the assumptions we made, uh, some of the technical challenges we faced, um, and then how we kind of took what we had built and applied it to a new market in a way we didn't quite um, uh, that we didn't quite predict accurately, if we can say it like that. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. So it's going to be a little bit of kind of talking about the products, but not on a kind of this is how they work level, but more on a conceptual level of this is what we're tr what we tried to build. And this is what we're uh, still building and going towards. So, you know, we, we say at least to clients and in marketing that we've spent five years building an award-winning AI engine for scientific text understanding. And with award-winning, we mean that we are, uh, are a semi-finalist in the AI for Good X Prize, which is all about applying AI for good causes. Um, and there we had, uh, you know, uh, several lovely people who were experts in NLP come in and vet our technology. So we, we know that what we're doing is, is unique and world leading. Uh, but of course, there's so much exciting NLP development happening, both on the, um, research side and the applied side. So we're, we're one of many working on it, but science is our field and not just, you know, science at large, research at large, but specifically now on chemistry in the chemical world, including pharma and material science and a variety of kind of tangential areas. All right. Um, what does our vision look like? I mentioned it a little bit. Ultimately, 2025, we're building an AI researcher, an AI system that can do interdisciplinary in inference beyond what humans can do and is an invaluable research uh, team member. That's a long goal. If we go all the way back in the beginning, as I mentioned, we built this assistant, uh, a suite of tools for academia, for academics, for researchers that need to do literature reviews systematically and thoroughly. And we built this machine that has a broad interdisciplinary understanding of, of the world of scientific research and helping humans do literature and review. And the status of those tools per today is that we have product market fit meaning we are selling the tools by yearly licenses, software as a service, and they're commercially available, um, being sold mostly to, um, to universities and then distributed to the entire university. Or we also have an individual model. So any individual researchers wanting to use the tools can then pay for monthly or yearly access. So those tools are kind of a commercial um, I will say success, but I'm going to preface that with a little asterisk that I'll get back to on, on some of our assumptions later. But they are a success from a, from a usage standpoint. And then comes the middle part, right? Because we started with this, OK, well, here's the literature reviews that we're going to build. And then we're going to reach this AI researcher. But then what's what's in between? And what ended up being in between, which is you know that transition is what I'm going to be talking mostly about today, is Iris AI, the AI research tools becoming a specialist. And what we decided to do, or a lot of deliberation, which I'll get back to, is diving into chemistry specifically. Also material science, pharma, those kinds of things. Biotech then next, to find knowledge and draw conclusions. The status per today is that we have our first, you know, commercial proof of concepts deliver, both sold and delivered. Uh, we have productified uh, solutions that are becoming commercially available this fall. And so we're kind of in this breaking point with those tools, um, both technically and, and market wise. And it's super exciting, but it's been quite an interesting journey to get there. But first, let's look a little bit of on the tools that we have built. And again, this is not a neither a sales pitch or a full demo, but I just want to give you a little bit of the impression of of what we developed. So we already pointed to that scientific research, you know, research papers are growing exponentially uh, in, in a variety of different fields. Um, and that is, you know, makes it impossible to navigate. And unless you're a deep domain expert that know all the experts there is to know in your field, and you're just looking for that, that one paper, what was it called again? It was from 2003, wasn't it? If you do that, you know, Google Scholar or whatever you want to use is fine. But the moment you're interdisciplinary, the moment you're exploring a new field, the moment you're a PhD student or master student and you don't know the field yet, 
this is just a mess, right? This is incredibly hard and you cannot navigate it. It is tedious, time consuming. You don't know the accuracy. And even if you are a domain expert, your interdisciplinary skills are going to be really, really tricky because keywords limits you to what you already know. All right. So what we're saying is we're going to let the AI research assistant do your literature review for you. And here are the two tools that we have developed and built and that are, as I said, live in the market and a commercial, um, at least decent success, if we want to put it that, that way, um, is a, an explore tool and a focus tool. So the process of the researcher will be, okay, I have a problem statement. I want to use that problem statement, usually having to like build out a full keyword query based on some guesswork and we're removing that part. But you take this problem statement, you branch out to find 500, 1,000, maybe 2,000 articles that could potentially solve your problem and cover everything you need to know. And then when you have all of that, well, you have to focus down, right? And you have to iterate down to a very, very precise reading list, and that's the focus tool. And then, of course, at the end, when you have your precise reading list with only relevant papers, you're still going to have to read the papers. But in this way, you don't have to read all the abstracts and titles of these papers in order to, uh, to build your, your literature review list. In short, what we do is that we take the input text, which, in, which can be your own self-written problem statement or the abstract and title of a research paper or patent, right? So a text, scientific language, three to 500 words. We take that text, we extract the most meaning bearing words from the text. We enrich it with contextual synonyms. We enrich it with hypernyms or topic modeled words, if you like. We combine all of that into a what we call the fingerprint, hence the fingerprints on the slide, but a, a, a word importance based matrix. And then we, we have our own proprietary uh, document similarity metric called wisdom or fingerprint matching, if you if you like the, the business term we're using. We basically do fingerprint matching. And then we have a heuristic um, geometrical function to distribute uh, the articles we've found and the fingerprint into categories and subcategories. And then we build this uh, Voronoi uh, diagram that you saw on the last page here, um, this visual overview over here are the main topics, here are the subtopics, and here are the papers matched with your problem statement, but within this subtopic. So distributed into categories. Um, and that's in short what we do. We have uh, amazing university clients all over Northern, uh, Northern Europe, um, and we have also proven that the tools work. And that was one of the things we wanted to do really early on was prove that these tools were not just like, you know, let me go back to slides. They were not just like a flashy interface and claiming to be some cool tech behind it. So we actually decided uh, to go out and run a bunch of experiments. And what we did was that we had multiple teams compete to solve the same research challenge over a few hours to see, you know, who used the tools, how much, and how did they perform when evaluated by an external jury. So we did that and found that compared to using PubMed and Google Scholar and all these kind of classical search engines, the users of our tools found more spot on papers, they could draw superior conclusions and they had a much better overview of the field. And this was true uh, both for master PhD students and for professor level as well, though the difference was higher uh, between the teams using Iris and not uh, when you were a younger, more inexperienced researcher. So, so we built this, we started selling it, um, and, and everything uh, was going great. Here is one assumption we made, which has nothing really to do with AI and machine learning, but one of the assumptions we made was that if we can take the systematic literature review process that now um, only academics really have time to do, but that industry say that they really want to do, they want to map out all research, they want to understand the, the scientific field they're operating in, they, they want to do it, but they don't have time. And so our assumption was if we can take that manual process and reduce it by 78%, which is the metric that we have for, for doing a systematic review with our tools, 78% time reduction, if we can do that, then we can sell these tools to industry, right? 
And that was our assumption. And uh, turns out that is not quite it. And it is really interesting to have learned this, that just because someone says they want to do something, you know, you, 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 br you, you bring them this tool, you develop it and you show it to them. And they're like, yeah, I don't, I don't need to map out everything. Can, can you just give me the answer, please? Can you just give me that one paper I need to read? I don't want to put in the work. And what it turns out to be is that a lot of R&D professionals in, in industry, they don't have the time. Even if the tool saves you 80% of time, you don't have the time to do it, which is unfortunate, but that's the reality of it. So where we found ourselves about two years ago was some really good tools, if we can say so ourselves, that we were selling to universities. But there's a couple of issues, right? Universities, unfortunately, don't have a lot of money. Now, personally, if I could, I would give our tools away for free to the universities because science is important. Um, I would give our tools away for free to individuals as well because science is important. But we are running a business, so unfortunately, we all need food on the table. We can't do that. So we are charging money for it, but we're not charging a lot. We are, we are barely charging what it costs us to run our servers and to train our models and to do the research. We have a research team of six people with PhDs and, and you know, that, that costs a bit of money. So we have to, um, we have to make that money. And so point being that we thought we could take the tools we've developed to academia and because we shorten the time so much, much more efficient. And that's something we hear with, with, with so many AI machine learning projects, right? Is that we can take this really big process and make it quicker. And what it turned out was that a lot of, and not everyone, but a lot of R and D personnel and a lot of R and D departments and industry said, yeah, we want to do that, that process and make it quicker. But when it came down to it, they didn't really want to do that. Um, and so, um, so what we had to do was rethink a little bit. We had these tools, we were selling them, but we couldn't charge enough money and uh, to, to really become a profitable company. And we also um, couldn't sell those same tools to industry. So we had to rethink entirely what we were doing. We tried to sell it, we ran a few pilots and we just realized this isn't working. We have to think differently. And so here is one of the ways we've ended up thinking differently. So we still talk about some of the same problems, right? Scientific and technical documents are vital for your innovation and R&D success, but they're really hard to efficiently leverage with human power. So we had to reformulate what the problem is, but the problem still is the same, right? Lots of documents, lots of content. What can we do about it? And then what we realized as we started interacting more in depth with our, our potential industry clients was that AI has a lot of promise, right? It really does. And the breakthroughs we're seeing within NLP and, and the things that are becoming possible and will become possible over the next few years are amazing. But out of the box, NLP does not work for complicated lingo and scientific research definitely is complicated language. A few years ago, we looked at kind of the, you know, our data set versus the Reuters database um, data set of, of news articles. And that was a vocabulary of 60,000 words that, that, you know, you would have to understand. And our data set had a vocabulary of 200,000 words, right? It is radically more complex. And so out of the box NLP doesn't work for scientific content is what we've found so far. Custom consultancy is incredibly expensive, and there's going to be so many technical consultancies out there telling big corporates that, yeah, 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 we can build this solution. It's expensive, and it usually doesn't work. The results are disappointing. So this is how we are framing what we're doing. And as you can notice, I'm, I'm still not really talking about any tools, because what we've found is that every R&D um, organization, especially in the really big corporates, will have a very specific problem that they're focused on. And it's slightly different from company to company ba based on their research process, um, their kinds of products, their strategy, their digitalization strategy, their product strategy. There's so many different components to it that leads to like, here is a specific problem we want to solve. And so here are some of the problems that we've seen within these large corporates. Now, as you will notice, all of this, all of these problems are related to here is a document that has some, some, some science in it uh, or has a technical or scientific or research nature. 
but whether the company needs to, you know, some companies needs to extra extract experiment data, right? Before going into the lab, we need our uh, competitors data so that we can test our material in the same way that they've done to hopefully say that our material is better, right? For some clients, it's about identifying new application areas. We have a material, it's, it's amazing, or a compound or an alloy, whatever it is, it's amazing but we can use it for this. And we are sure that there must be other use cases for it out there that we could open new business lines in and make more money, right? Then there's still the need to do literature reviews. It's just that corporate, you know, R&D literature reviews has to be so much more efficient. And I'll get back to that. Um, here's a set of documents. I just really need a quick overview of it. Uh, we have decades of in-house knowledge. And if you'll notice, I'm going kind of around the clock on my slide here. We have decades of old in-house knowledge in the team. How can we figure out what we already know? Can we find research funding grants for, um, for uh, our project? Is it fundable? Um, can we extract all pain points from a patent? These are just some of the plethora of different challenges that we are actually all tackling uh, with our tech. And so that's kind of where we got to. And again, you'll see the, the slide, right? We spent five years building this engine. Um, it is now custom trained on chemistry and it can be reinforced on a specific client's domain with a small set of patents and an seed ontology, which is pretty cool. And a good you know, starting point we have with having the machine trained uh, on a general data set. Um, the tool is modular, and that's actually something we've learned that we have to modularize it because everyone has a unique challenge. So we've just kind of picked apart the different modules and said, this is a modular tool. We can assemble it so that it works for your specific challenge and problem. And then, of course, we've already built this module, so we can actually deliver it at a cost that is, you know, very competitive compared to um, uh, compared to consultancies that want to build things from scratch. Um, we have worked here uh, with a couple of clients, and, and it is super interesting when you're early, early stage, and here's a, here's a meta um, consideration again, when you're early stage and you want to go out there and talk to clients and meet them, you get this, you know, <clears throat> especially if you have some core tech, like we have NLP for, for scientific text, it, it can be used in so many areas, right? And it's so vital, and it has been to us, to meet the clients exactly in the process of having a project. And so the extract tool that you can see here, where the client needed to extract experiment data from competitors' patents before going into the lab, they were looking for a solution. And we happened to stumble up on them, tiny little Iris AI at that time, stumbled up on this massive uh, multinational company, and turns out that we could build exactly what they needed. And what that is, is a tool that extracts and links all relevant data points from text and tables to populate, um, in their case, a spreadsheet. These are pretty neat. Uh, we can do what for them is two months of manual work. And when we say work, we really mean like someone with like at least a postdoc, right? Someone who has, you know, serious experience in their field. They have to sit for two months and extract the data from 100 patents. We can do it in four minutes at 90% accuracy or about 97% uh, uh, precision and we're at 78% or so recall. So um, pretty, uh, pretty exciting and neat. Um, that is one of the use cases we've, we've uh, played with, delivered to, I should say, executed on. And then there is discover. And this is interesting, right? So you, you will see in the picture here that it looks very, very similar to what we built earlier, right? But when we came out with this general tool and said, it's it understands all science, it's, you know, all research, it's a, it's a literature review tool. And, you know, the client, the potential, are, you know, clients in R&D said, that's great. But, but we want it to be specialized. We are specialized and we want the tool to be specialized. So what we developed was a way to, to reinforce or strengthen the model within the client specific domain. And all we need is a set of about 2000 documents from the client's domain. And remember earlier, we have this tool to do literature reviews. So it's quite easy to like find 2000 articles, 
reinforce the machine on the client's domain. And suddenly we have a custom, a bespoke search tool or discover tool specifically for that client's research area. And so what this is essentially is a content-based recommendation engine for scientific papers and patents, custom delivered uh, with you know, the specialty of that um, of that uh, potential client. So that's pretty cool. Um, some of the things we're doing and basically what we're looking, how we're looking and how we've reshaped entirely the way we think about what we do is it's not a tool that we're selling here and a tool that we're selling here. What we have are all of these functional modules like text similarity comparison and table information extraction, which is a machine vision algorithm and table and text linking, which is, of course, the tricky part about data extraction, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not going to bore you with going through all this, but we're working with knowledge graphs. We have a variety of different uh, classification and clustering and categorization algorithms etc. Then, of course, this easy domain specialization where we, you know, the core engine is is trained on on a data set of, of you know, interdisciplinary papers, and we can easily specialize um, either using a small seed ontology or um, or these 2000 articles. Uh, and then we have a variety of different ways to visualize, develop the UX. Um, and we're also working on uh, abstractive summarization, hypothesis extraction, and turning some of these modules into tools with a conversational AI so you can actually go back and forth with the tool. And so if you look at what that actually looks like in terms of modules on the use cases from earlier, here's the extraction use case. So first of all, we need to specialize the, the core engine on the domain of the, of the client. Then we use table information extraction and extraction of entities from the text. Then we link the table uh, and text. And for that, we use causality, compositionality, and a knowledge graph. And then we combine all of that together to extract all the data points, all the processes, all the products from the tables and the text in a patent. So that's the extraction tool. Um, and then, of course, we want to add in some um, some assessment and some explainability, really. And we have a self-assessment module where the tool continuously will tell the user how certain it is that the rows and columns were extracted correctly so that it's easy for the user to go in and modify and, and double check and verify that the tool, which the tool is, is not yet um, sure of. So that's kind of how we're using this like modular approach for the extraction. And then there's the patent discovery, uh, which you know you will see bear quite resemblance to, as I said, this discover, um, this uh, this uh, academic tool. But here we have the domain specialization, text similarity, document categorization, and then a very clear visualization component to it as well, where we look at here are the main different the main um, categories and subcategories, as you saw earlier as well. And then, of course, there's going to be more interesting things we're going to we're going to be doing. And here we are still looking for those first um, courageous and future visionary um, clients in in chemicals and um, and and you know material science, pharma, etc. Where we're looking at application identification. So again, we have to do the domain spe specialization, but we we'll also work with text similarity, knowledge graphs, and then essentially a content-based recommendation engine in the shape of a conversational engine. So again, combining multiple of this to say, here is my material. What other things could this material be used for? And then you have a conversation with the AI that draws on the knowledge graph to be able to accurately recommend, not here is a full paper, but here is that part of a paper that is, describes what might just be an application area for your um, for your product, for your alloy, for your chemical, for your um, you know material. So that's super exciting, um, and we're having a lot of fun with this, and a lot of fun kind of navigating our way around these massive clients to figure out what exactly is it that we can deliver. And so what we are. What we're really navigating here, which I think a lot, if there's any other kind of AI startups on the other line uh, listening, what we're navigating here is like, 
not becoming a consultancy, still staying a product company, but also having these really kind of customized approaches that will fit these large companies well. So that's kind of what we're navigating. Like, how can you modularize something that is so specific, um, yet also universally applicable? And I know that's totally a contradiction, but that is that is what it feels like and, and that is what it is. Um, and so with that, uh, this is our business development manager. Uh, I'll put his name on the slide. You're also welcome to uh, to contact me, which is Anita at iris.ai. Amin is our main uh, business development manager. If someone has specific questions about the tools, um, you know, where we're at right now is that we, um, are kind of in the early stage of the growth phase. We've kind of reached the past, you know, the first few hurdles. We are, um, you know, we are, we're actually generating money. We're, you know, an, an AI startup that's actually generating good money and is not in marketing. That's pretty neat, if I can say so myself. We're really tackling something that we feel is, is fundamentally important. Uh, and we continue to feel that we are a for impact company for profit too, for sure. But what we're doing, you know, in the world that we live in right now, scientific understanding, scientific literacy, and scientific research continues to be of vital importance, I believe, for the survival of the human species. And, and AI and machine learning, the way we implement it, but also the way a lot of other really amazing people are implementing it, is going to be of fundamental importance to the success of, of the human species. So with that i thank you very much for listening and i'm looking forward to see if there are any questions for me thanks so much uh, anita we have a question yes we have one uh, how do you guarantee the min that minimizing research time does not come out at the cost of data inaccuracy so if there is a balance between uh, time saving and uh, accuracy and a second one that it's telling that 90% uh, accuracy it's it's good but the data structure looks very unsupervised. What's your opinion on this? Yeah. So if we take the first of the first uh, question first, which is like the the time versus the the, the solid solidity of the results, right? What what might we be missing out on? Um, and the way um, our tools. So if we look at the academic tools and kind of the systematic review tools, that is actually a question of you can um, you can go as much back and forth as you want. There is always in these tools there is the option of uh, of uh, you know manually reviewing, and that's why um, you know if you need about we'll say about an eighty five percent accuracy, so eighty five percent precision and recall for for a literature review search, then you don't have to do a lot of manual review, right? Getting to eighty five percent is not that hard. Uh, with the tools that we have. Now, getting to 90%, getting to 95%, getting to academic precision of 99%, there you do need a lot of manual verification. And that's why this normally takes six months and with our tools, a couple of months, right? For the academic precision. So there we actually have a very clear manual, you know, you go back and forth with the tool to verify. So there's a lot of manual verification and there's no automation in that. When it comes to the um, extraction tool, and the question, I guess, was, uh, you know, 90% um, accuracy is good. It's mainly unsupervised. I think that was the question. And and yes, there is, I mean, that one is entirely kind of, you, you plop the patent into a folder and you get a spreadsheet at the other end. That's why we're actually implementing this self-assessment module where the tool gives you a very clear indication on how confident it is. Right, so you can very easily see, uh, you know, marked with colors. Like here is where the tool is less certain, so you can go in and validate it. Um, and of course, we also work when we work with a client. We make sure that we uh, that we validate. You know, we we start with a, an ontology and we reinforce the the machine on their domain. But we also have the client spend a few hours actually then reviewing the the points in the knowledge graph to say. Are these, you know, are these accurate? Are there any inconsistencies? Was the training successful? And so we always ask from the client a couple of hours of their time to to evaluate the model, 
um, before going into the extraction. But then the extraction itself is automatic, as I said, with the self-assessment. So you can go in afterwards and see, does this make sense? Are the, are the results accurate? So I hope that answered the, the question yeah, and if I understood yeah, the question yeah, right. Yeah. Thank you, Anita, for, for being with us and thank you for, for, for the answer. It's, uh, it's time for a break. In 10 minutes, we'll be back with the last session. Uh, so it's probably the moment for the last coffee of the day. Uh, if you are a little bit worried about the sleeping, maybe it's not a good moment for, <laughs> for coffee. So uh, we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you, Anita. Bye. Thank you.